Well, um, I'm going to take us back to some of the domestic politics that are occurring right now, um, particularly the activism and, and some of the issues that viewers had with uh, a very spontaneous conversation that Nando and I had last week. So Nando Vila and I were talking casually and spontaneously about cancel culture and the whole hashtag movement to boycott Goya Foods. Of course, this was in response to the CEO uh, of Goya saying that he is a Trump supporter. He appeared at some Trump event and talked about how uh, Trump is this great president. And, and understandably, people in um, on the left, members of the Latino community did not like that. And they uh, felt betrayed because Goya is a staple brand in Latino communities um, throughout the United States. So uh, I understand that feeling of betrayal. I understand, you know, the frustration for a CEO to identify with Trump or to support Trump. I'm not taking anything away from that. But the reason why I personally, I'm not speaking for Nando, I personally had a problem with the uh, boycott movement on social media is because this isn't my first rodeo. And so I've experienced multiple boycott movements uh, throughout my career. And it's and I have been on board with some of those movements and then later felt a little frustrated, maybe um, a little weak because of what the outcome was of those boycotts. And that actually forced me to look into the historical context of boycotts. How, have they ever worked? How do they work? And what can we do to actually take the frustrations that we feel and, and, and use them to change the system rather than focus solely on shaming and punishment online? Because really that's, what these boycott movements have become, and they aren't effective. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, where boycotts have been successful. But first, let me just focus specifically on um, a critique that I, I saw on Twitter. And, um, you know, I don't want this person in any way to feel uh, attacked. I just think that this is a good starting off point to explain in a more nuanced way why I have some issues uh, with these boycott movements. So uh, this individual writes, can't believe I'm watching Anna Kasparian and Nando Vila on Jacobin whining about cancel culture and shitting on Goya boycott as a distraction. Food is a major part of any culture and Goya is a staple in many Latino households. And uh, continues, not acknowledging the betrayal, there, there is tone deaf um, at best, and what kind of socialists refute that boycotting is a very effective tool, sometimes even the only tool we have for change, this segment is messy. So I actually do uh, refute that boycotts on their own are not, uh, are a very effective tool. I, I totally disagree with that. If you have nothing more but a boycott movement on social media, it is not effective. It just isn't. You need to have a well-organized uh, strategic plan in place in order to have the boycott be, you know, a supplement to that, something that can help a movement, something that can help drive the change that you're looking for. But a simple hashtag, I mean, look, it's been a little over a week now. What happened to the boycott movement with Goya? Nothing. And so um, I, that's one part of it. The other part of it that I just wanted to mention is that increasingly I'm becoming um, a little grossed out by what I'm seeing on social media. That's not to say that people uh, share ideological views or perspectives that I disagree with, maybe in, in some cases might even make me angry. But we have increasingly become and we have supported the type of society that I personally do not want to live in. And it's a society that doesn't actually focus on strategic activism. It focuses on guilt tripping people, shaming people, attempting to destroy the livelihoods of people that individuals disagree with. And it happens both on the right and the left. And I think that creating this type of vigilante surveillance state is going to do absolutely nothing to help working people in this country. It's going to do absolutely nothing to make people happier. It's going to do nothing to build solidarity with people. And it is only further driving us apart from one another into all of these little micro groups that we identify with. And we create these bubbles 
that are not in any way productive for today's society. And in order for us to really um, spur change, we need to have dialogue and we need to do so fearlessly without worrying that we're going to be cast aside and, you know, blackballed and all of these other, you know, um, forms of punishment that I'm seeing on social media. And yes, it, it does play into this whole notion of cancel culture. I highly recommend you guys check out um, the talk that Ben Burgess did for Jacobin on cancel culture. It was one of the most nuanced, um, smart discussions that I've heard on the, on the issue. In fact, probably the smartest. So please check that out. But now let me just uh, talk a little bit about you know, just the history of boycott movements and um, how they've played out. So let's focus on recent history because um, this Goya boycott led to pretty much nothing because inevitably there is a counter group that's going to come in and say, oh, oh, the left doesn't like Goya because the CEO supports Trump. By the way, he was also very supportive of the Obamas and helped Michelle Obama with her, you know, healthy living campaign. Um, but let's put that aside for a second. Conservatives came in and said, all right, well, then we're going to go ahead and buy um, mass amounts of Goya. You had Ivanka Trump, uh, you know, posing in a goofy picture on Twitter. Uh, it was embarrassing. She should feel embarrassed. Uh, but the Trumps have um, absolutely no self-awareness whatsoever, and they're completely delusional. So she kept that ridiculous picture up. And then immediately after that, um, conservatives did stock up on the product. I don't know how much of an impact it had on Goya as a business, uh, but what I do know is it's not a publicly traded company. It's kind of hard to see if this uh, negatively or positively impacted uh, the price of its shares because it's not, again, a publicly uh, uh, a publicly traded company, but we did hear about right wing activists who uh, took matters into their own hands. And here's a quick example of that. Let's go to the video. Well, now there is a counter push, a boycott, actually pushing back against the boycott. One supporter has started a GoFundMe page to buy Goya products. Casey Harper is the man who's doing it. And he's on the screen right now. Casey, all right, let's get right at it. How much have you... Yeah, I think you've only been doing this a couple of days. How much have you right. raised? Well, we started on Saturday afternoon, and uh, we're already up. I just refreshed. If you refresh every you know, few minutes, you'll see a different number, but we're over 160,000 now. So it's really taken off. And so the CEO of Goya didn't uh, in any way uh, backpedal or equivocate his support for Trump. Uh, he went on Fox News and continued saying that he supports Trump and also mentioned that he was supportive of the Obamas. And the reason why he was supportive of both administrations is because he's a CEO. We need to address how the elite class is going to do anything and everything possible to suck up to political power because this entire system is based on quid pro quos. It's all based on, hey, favor for a favor. What can I do to be friendly to this administration? What can I do to donate money to uh, the administration's reelection campaign? What can I do to suck up to power so I get my tax cuts, so I get all of the business favors that I'm looking for, which, of course, only further um, enrich the elite class? That's what we need to focus on. Uh, but instead of doing that, it's oh, this person supports a candidate or a politician I dislike, and as a result, I'm going to publicly shame that person. I have news for you, uh, the elite class doesn't care. Only 25% of boycotts lead to a public uh, statement apologizing or maybe backtracking. That means 75% of the time, these boycotts do nothing. Um, and that's pretty devastating if you're actually serious about trying to change a system. And by the way, the outcome of the Goya boycott reminded me a lot of what happened with Chick-fil-A back in 2012 when uh, the COO of the company, Dan Cathy, was uh, very transparent in how he did not support same-sex marriage. Liberals were very upset about that. They said that they were going to go ahead and uh, boycott Chick-fil-A. So how did that turn out? Let's look at the video. From South Carolina to Texas and Ohio, Chick-fil-A supporters turned out in force Wednesday to stand up for the fast food chain. Thousands and thousands of people. But it wasn't just about the chicken. Marriage is between one man and one woman. Many showed up to back Dan Cathy, Chick-fil-A's president and COO.
But on Facebook, more than 600,000 people answered former Arkansas Governor Mike Huckabee's call for a Chick-fil-A Appreciation Day. This is where I just wanted to take a stand on God's word and come here and have a meal. So that's it. And so, look, I don't mean to pick on boycotts uh, that have been started by liberals or maybe even people on the left, because every political ideology is guilty of doing this. A recent example involving uh, the right wing had to do with Nike's ad campaign featuring uh, Colin Kaepernick. And if you can recall uh, that campaign, I thought it was awesome. Um, it included the text saying, believe in something, even if it means sacrificing everything. And of course, conservatives were angry about it. They couldn't take it. Uh, there were all sorts of embarrassing videos posted on social media of right wingers uh, burning their Nike shoes. Here's a quick example for you. Here I am in Florida during a tropical storm and Nike done me the off. Burn, mother Seems like a pleasant guy. Um, so, all right, uh, what happened to Nike following this uh, conservative boycott of the ba uh, brand? Um, about a week later, its uh, shares shot up. Uh, it did really well because it's a corporation that has um, an incentive to profit as much as humanly possible. And they made uh, a calculated decision to feature Colin Kaepernick because they knew that it would help their sales. And it did. And so the conservative boycott didn't work. It was just like the conservative boycott of Disneyland years ago. That didn't work. There's been all sorts of boycotts, both by the right and the left, that have been embarrassing. And I think what we're seeing with social media is the quick dopamine rush that people get when they're part of this kind of movement. In your mind, it's substituting real activism and doing the hard work that's necessary for systemic change. And um, there have been uh, incredibly important scholarly, scholarly studies on boycotts and how effective they really are. Um, there's a professor uh, from Northwestern University, Braden King, who actually gave a great interview uh, to Freakonomics Radio, but I wanna read a quick quote. And he says, it's just hard to stop buying a product you're used to buying. Even consumers who are ideologically supportive of a boycott don't tend to follow through and support the boycott because they, want, they won't want to change their behavior. And so you might hear all of the uh, statements about how people are gonna boycott something. You might see the tweets or the posts on Facebook, but whether people actually carry out that boycott with action uh, remains to be seen in a lot of cases. And look, that's not to say that boycotts can't be helpful as part of a movement. If you take a boycott on its own and you don't have like a, a, an activist infrastructure around it, if you don't have strategy around it, it'll lead to nothing. And that's what we've seen in all the various examples that I've given you guys. Um, but I'll give you the example of the Montgomery bus boycott, which I think is such an excellent example. Was it the Montgomery bus boycott that spurred change during the civil rights movement? Of course not. In fact, the NAACP uh, wrote about this on their website, and I wanted to share some of it with you. And of course, it has to do with Rosa Parks and how she refused to move to the back of the bus. The NAACP writes, contrary Contrary to the folkloric uh, accounts of her civil rights ro role, Miss Parks or Mrs. Parks was not too tired to move from her seat. Rather, she had been acknowledgeable, or I'm sorry, she had been knowledgeable. She had been a knowledgeable NAACP stalwart for many years and gave the organization the incident it needed to move against segregation in the unreconstructed heart of the Confederacy. Uh, Montgomery, Alabama. Mrs. Parks headed the youth division of the Montgomery NAACP branch for years. So there was actual coordination, organizing, um, you know, people who had a plan in mind when this incident happened with Rosa Parks. And as soon as uh, the event took place, they moved into gear, went to the courts, Right. And it, this case, even though uh, Rosa Parks wasn't part of the final Supreme Court case, uh, 
the issue of civil rights did go to the Supreme Court, and that was where uh, people were able to accomplish some change. I give you that example because, again, the boycotts on its the boycott on its own didn't lead to change, but having that as part of a well thought out strategic plan um, was important. It was it was part of it. Uh, but I think that what we're seeing right now is just like that quick fix. Like, I don't like this. I don't like what someone said. I don't like this tweet from 10 years ago. I don't like that this CEO is CEOing and doing what a CEO is supposed to do by looking out for his own self-interest. So I'm going to put out a nasty tweet or start a boycott movement with a hashtag on Twitter and it'll feel good for a day or two and then I'll forget about it. And that's what we're seeing every single week at this point with um, this social media activism. And I just want people to know that if you want real change, if you are genuine and sincere about it, then act like it and, and recognize where we've fallen short, where we can improve and don't take critiques like this personally, because you're justified in being upset at how this system is. You're justified in being horrified uh, by CEOs who would support someone as cruel and vicious as Donald Trump. But the reason why I was dismissive of the Goya boycott is because I knew exactly how it would turn out. And I was right. So, uh, Michael, let me know what you think. No, I think that there's so much there. And I think that the confusion of tactics and strategy and, and just there, there's so many things to unpack. Um, and again, really making like there's the efficacy, but then it's like, you know, whatever. Goya is different than like an individual. I think, you know, that's a very important distinction. But the actual efficacy of these things, I'll just say real quick before we get to Vivek, like even going back to the 90s, uh, I don't think he ended up doing it. But Dick Morris, who is, you know, Bill Clinton's advisor and advised all these Republicans, just kind of like a caricature of like an amoral political consultant. He was pitching to brands. He's like, I'll do politics for brands. Like, I want to work for Reebok and do ads that show Nike sweatshops. Um, and in a funny way, like, you know, brands are never going to go that aggressive, obviously, because they're all using sweatshops in that example. But that sort of like consumer activism is baked into the cake. Like, I think people need to really remind themselves that the companies are extremely sophisticated and they're making calculations <laughs> constantly. So it's like, they know about this, this conversation about consumer boycotts and how it can be leveraged and what trade-offs to make, just like you said, in the perfect Nike example. I mean, Nike looked at its numbers and it's like, great. Some asshole has like a tantrum about Colin Kaepernick that will move even more units. Like the freak out is baked into it. And so, you know, the, the boycotts that are part of an overall strategy that actually fit, um, and even there, you know, like I think so, I think it's still a really important tactic, but we have to look like what what do boycotts mean now when a company like Amazon has basically a limitless access to resources and federal bailout funds? I mean, these are really big questions that we're going to actually have to deal with. But I loved it. Yeah, exactly. And, and one final thing that I want to mention, because you could even look at this uh, uh, on a macro scale or you could look at how it's applied in in foreign policy, right? So uh, in South Africa, I know you've been talking about South Africa a lot. Um, during the apartheid in the United States, there was a boycott divestment movement. Right. Uh, but that boycott div divestment movement did not work because um, you know business interests in South Africa were able to uh, do the trade that they needed to stay alive and remain highly profitable by doing it through other African countries, right? So there are always loopholes, there are always ways uh, to work around a boycott. Again, that's not to say that a boycott or a divestment like, movement. So I'm sorry, not to interrupt. It's like, it did work to the extent that they were worried about the international perception of them in a different yes. time. So like Israel isn't as an example. So I think, again, I do think like BDS against the apartheid or against Israel is like correct, but I think you're totally right. Like we fetishize these things that can easily be worked around. They are worked around. They usually hit, if you're talking on a nation state, like normal people, they don't hit like the power centers in a society. And then it's also like, especially when you're thinking about public perception, the concerns like i am so thankful that apartheid was destroyed in the late 80s and early 90s that that's when the transition happened because in 2020 
there would be a lot of governments that would be extremely comfortable with supporting that system overtly. Um, so, you know, I, I, but yeah, so we're, we're like actually going in the opposite direction globally of like the efficacy of these things. So it's stuff to like really think about. I completely agree with you. Thank you.